Happy Tuesday, Pro-Life family. Grab a cup of coffee, pull up a chair. We wanna talk about the hard cases. Everybody's talking about SCOTUS. They're talking about the overturning of Roe v. Wade. And we've got some topics that we don't normally discuss that are all hot culture items right now. So let's get started. Happy Tuesday, Pro-Life family. So, awesome cast of characters as always. Pro-Life cast, Kim Schwartz, Media Communications Director. Veronica Arnold-Smither, Education Director. Emily Cook, our General Counsel. Brent Klingerman, IT Director. So, we wanted to talk about, this seems to be hot news these days. Everybody's saying, you know, what happens after Rose overturned, but how are we gonna deal with the hard cases? Women are gonna die. Etc. And so we're all kind of getting these in Facebook DMs and conversations, friends and family. Angry neighbors. Angry neighbors. <laughs> um, so we wanted to have the conversation. How can we deal with, how can we help you deal with all of these hard questions, the hard questions that we um, are so often brought up in the argument in favor of abortion? Well, let's start first with. Um what is the reality of elective abortion in the United States right now? What is the percentage of elective abortion in the United States that are for reasons of rape, life of the mother, or incest? Anyone yeah. know? Or disabilities even, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so all of the hard cases combined are about 7% of all abortions. And that doesn't minimize uh, those experiences of the parents or the uh, the value of the lives of the child, but it's all it's really important to get an awareness of the disposition of somebody who's making that argument. Um, I guarantee you, every single person listening to this podcast, if you've ever had a conversation about abortion, someone has asked you, well, what about rape? What about if the child has a disability? Or what about if the mother's life is in danger? Yeah. I guarantee you, you've had that question. And so it's important to ask um, and understand the disposition of the person who's um, having this conversation with you. If we uh, banned all abortions, except for in those cases, would you support that? And most of the time they're going to say no, which indicates that it's not that they actually care about those hard cases, it's that they're using the exception to justify the rule. They're using yeah. the 7% yep. to justify the 93%. And that's a logical fallacy. They should not um, do that. But also it just, it <laughs> minimizes from their perspective, the value of those lives. Again, abortion in those cases of uh, rape and whenever the child has a disability, like those are still wrong. Um, and those lives are valuable. Yeah, but you can't yeah. use those smaller percentages as a scapegoat to legalize all abortion. In fact, I've heard women who have chosen life after conceiving due to rape say, don't you dare use me as your scapegoat to mm -hmm. legalize abortion because they are not pro-abortion. Now, like you said, we can't minimize those cases. We can't just say, oh, it's a small percentage. It's just a small number. We have to actually address their real concerns. Like, well, how do you save a mother whose life is in danger? How do you address the, the issue of rape and trauma? And what about a child who's actually living with a disability because the parents couldn't seek an abortion and now they're not sure what to do and they're angry about it. We have to actually address all those social concerns too. Well, and we will. We'll help yeah. you. So we want to talk through those and we want to talk through them because once you've talked about that six, seven, eight percent, wherever it falls in, um, the only argument left is, well, because I want to. Yeah. Right. Hmm. Because of convenience, abortion yeah. for convenience. Right. So let's talk about those and let's talk about them not in I hate to say it, but not in a biblical context, because typically the people you're having this conversation, pseudo argue, almost argument with, um, they're not coming at it from a biblical background. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're going to so talk. So they didn't land today. here from their faith. Right. I mean, so, I disagree with that. Uh, uh, there are those. I mean, I have. All, there are those. Well, I, most of the people I'm talking to that I ask that question con consider themselves conservative Christians. Yikes. Yeah, Oof, I think hurts. it really it helps to know your audience and um, 
you know, basically like my point of view is as long as you believe that killing people is wrong, you know, <laughs> we can have that common ground and then have this conversation. So however it is that you got to your conclusion that killing people is wrong, great, we can have this discussion, uh, whether that came from your faith or if you're a secular person, you don't believe in the Bible, uh, but you still believe, you know, killing people yeah. is wrong. That would not create a very functional society. We can have this discussion. Yeah. It's cool. So I had a conversation this uh, recently about, you know, right after the Supreme Court opinion came out with a family member um, who thinks that abortion is wrong and, and you know, has been around me for a, you know, for a very long <laughs> uh -huh. time. And they said, they asked if right to life would be against um, an eight-year-old who was pregnant and mm. about rape and incest. And... So they're going for the heartstrings cases. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Correct. I mean, it's a real concern. We do need to address things like that. Absolutely. Yeah. We can't use those as a scapegoat. What did you say? Absolutely. Abortion say, does not solve that problem. Sure. What I mean, what, what, exactly what I said was that a child growing is no different than a child growing in my womb. How you are... Uh, the, that, the answer, the result of abortion in that case is is killing that child is no different than me going and killing my child. Mm -hmm. Just when you put, I said, you can't, if you don't believe that that child is, is his or her own human being and that life is created by God in every other case, you don't, then you don't really believe abortion is wrong because it's the killing of a, a person. You can't make that distinction between, um, the situation, uh, how someone is conceived, does not put qualif does not somehow put a different type of qualification on their life. They're still right. a human person, just as if that baby was inside of me. Mm -hmm. the, the circumstances right. don't negate that value, the, negate the humanity of the unborn child. And if you believe it does, then your belief against some abortion is for some other reason other than it's an unborn child. Yeah. It, so if I'm child. the pro-choicer in the conversation, or even maybe I'm just a concerned pro-lifer that does not know how to handle the eight-year-old pregnancy, mm -hmm. and I say, sure, that's fine and good. I agree with you. This is a baby. But what about this eight-year-old? What are you going to do? How are you going to help her? What do you say? Well, it's heartbreaking because, and we've seen this from uh, Planned Parenthood and other abortion groups that whenever there is somebody who is a victim of sexual assault, whether that is a child or somebody who's being trafficked, the abortion doesn't solve that situation. In fact, the abortion makes it worse because if you have this eight-year-old who's being sexually abused at home, the abuser can take her to have an abortion, cover up the crime that has happened, and then the abortion industry will just hand her back into the arms of her abuser. So this doesn't solve the problem that she's in. It turns her right back into that circumstance that she's in. And so it's just compounding her as a victim. It creates another victim uh, in the child who's being aborted. And that doesn't solve the problem. Like abortion does not solve these social issues. It covers up these problems yeah. and it reminds me of the movie precious uh, i highly recommend it it's about this young woman i'm pretty sure it's based on a true story too she was being uh sexually assaulted by her by her stepfather or like mother's boyfriend for years over and over again multiple pregnancies mm -hmm. before she even graduated from high school and finally a school counselor got involved i don't know why they didn't get involved way sooner and address the incest and but when asked this young woman named precious talked about how she would never have wanted to abort her children. She understood that they were also precious. And then, and people kept offering her abortion and kept saying, you know, you're too young for a baby. You already have one or all of these things. And she was like, don't you dare, you know? Yeah, I don't want to be raped, but don't you dare. This is my baby. Yeah. And she understood. She had this really primal understanding of what it means to be human and that and she was a victim mm -hmm. and she did not want to victimize her child and so the the eight-year-old i mean there are real cases that have happened recently in the past couple of years of very young women uh it's hard to even say no. women mm -hmm. young girls who have reached puberty way earlier than the average girl who have gotten pregnant by ancestor rape just like this girl precious and uh they 
I don't want them to have to live with this trauma of abortion on top of the trauma that they've already been enduring. And so what the best thing for them is to re immediately remove them from this abusive situation, get them really good counseling and therapy because God knows they need it. Mm -hmm. And and then say, OK, you're pregnant. We're going to help you be we're going to help you with your pregnancy. We're going to give you really good health care. Talk about adoption. Talk about grandma can raise both of you. I mean, there are there are really good cases of a good turnout like that. But Veronica, therapy is expensive. And where are you going to find those resources? Uh, pregnancy centers, huh. like <laughs> all, all over, you know, we have these resources that can actually help the woman who, or the girl, uh, whoever the victim of sexual assault is in that instance. We have these resources that can actually help her heal from that. Abortion is not one of them. Abortion does not help you heal from that trauma. And there's actually it studies. There's studies that say this much. Um, you know, we've uh, published about this, I believe, on our website. And it says, these studies say that for women who are victims of rape and they become pregnant from that, most of the women who um, chose to abort would have worse healing outcomes in the long term than women who chose life. And I think it's like what you said, Veronica, the trauma of the assault on top of the trauma of abortion um, you know, that doesn't help. And then the other side of it is that people, society, it's another avenue of victim shaming. So society will say, well, if you have an abortion, the pain will go away. If you have an abortion, you're just going to forget. That is so insulting. I cannot believe it. Like it's, it does not make that hurt go away. There's yeah. no way abortion can make You have to address that. the trauma of mm -hmm. rape and not just say, oh, you'll move on faster if you have an abortion. It's yeah. like, God. And That's then awful. in this same study on the reasons of like why women considered abortion after sexual assault, they said, uh, well, it's because of what society would think of me. And they right. said that people will say, well, if you're pregnant after rape, you must have really wanted it. And oh, that's terrible. God. Yes. These these are coming from the mouths of human beings who claim to uh, have the best interest of women and sexual assault uh, survivors at heart. And the exact opposite is true when it comes to their actions. Yeah. All that they have to be believed stuff just went away, huh? Yeah, sure. yeah. So if you want more on this specific topic uh, or want to read stories of amazing survivors, there's an awesome website called save the one percent.com or maybe it's save the one dot com. I think it's save the one. Save the one dot com. And it's it is we'll a, find a link and we'll put, a it in, we'll put it in the description of, for us. Of people who have either been sexually assaulted and chosen life or the children who were raised by these super brave moms who said, you're my baby. Because so many times mm -hmm. society says like, oh, you don't want to raise this rapist baby. And they're like, it's my baby. Right. The, the rapist is in jail or he's out of the picture. This is my baby. So go read these amazing stories. Yeah. So let's, let's wrap up this uh, point right here of what to say whenever somebody says, well, what about rape? So the first thing to understand and to say is address the heartbreak and the trauma that the woman has endured, because that is really the heart of the problem there. And then go forward and say that abortion doesn't solve that problem. Uh, we've talked about how, um, you know, the studies say that in the long term, Women who choose life have actually better healing outcomes and that abortion covers up abortion whenever uh, there's a minor who's being abused, maybe or somebody who's being human trafficked, that the abortion covers up and sends the victim right into the hands of the abuser again. Um, any other? Also, a lot of studies show that uh, women who choose abortion in general, whether due to conceiving and rape or not, uh, have like what, like a 50 percent plus uh increase in risk of depression and suicide and drug abuse and alcohol abuse. And so imagine having dealt with one trauma and now you add another trauma of abortion, you, the risk of these abuses is just terrible, but terribly high. So if you want, if you really care about a woman who has endured this trauma, then what you would want to do immediately is give her the good health care that reduces these risks mm -hmm. and abortion would do the opposite. It would yeah. increase them. And if, especially if you're talking to someone who believes that other abortion is wrong, 
challenge them on their premise of why do they believe that? Because it doesn't make any logical sense then if you believe that some abortion is, if you believe abortion in any other circumstance is wrong, well, there is, there's nothing different yeah. about mm -hmm. the baby growing who was conceived and raped as it was the baby who was conceived in a one night stand in college. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I would say to that is, I you, I can tell you're a really compassionate person and you care about these extremely awful, unusual cases. These 1% like off the wall, crazy cases. You're obviously clearly compassionate. What we need to do is direct that compassion to help someone instead of use an abortion. Mm -hmm. So you're on the right track. Your compassion is in the right place. Right. Now let's put it to use. And no child should pay the death penalty for somebody else's stupid right. crime. Right. So. Um, All right. What next about life of, of the, the hard topics? <laughs> There's more. Life of the mother. Okay. What about what if the life of the mother is in danger? This is my soapbox. Uh, I, I, okay, yes. do everything that you can to save both lives. Like I make this point all the time to the media, and the media hates it. Um, <laughs> they hate Wonder lots why? Of things. Wonder it's, why? The pro-life question should not be either the mother or the child. It should always be both and. We should always try to do everything we can, whether it's the woman is in a hard social situation, she doesn't have a job and she's in college and she's gonna get kicked out. Or maybe, you know, her life is in danger from this pregnancy and we have to do everything we can to save both the mother and the child. And sometimes that's not possible. And sometimes the child will die uh, from these natural uh, causes, but, we should not be introducing the cause of death to that child right. ourselves. Yeah. You can deliver early, um, which sometimes that happens uh, anyway. Um, some children are born prematurely against you know our plans and they make it. Um, and yeah. sometimes they don't and that is tragic. But the reality is we didn't try to kill them. Right. We didn't try to kill them. Yeah. And I wanna make a point too, because I think this is something that's really lost in our culture because our culture is swimming in the shallow end of the philosophy pool over here. Like, <laughs> you ain't are, kidding, sister. We are not really good at this philosophy thing lately in our culture. There is a moral difference between actively killing someone or their condition is what kills them. So for example, if there is a starving child in Africa and- I haven't heard this one in a while. Oh, this one. I actually heard it at my fellowship training. So oh, really? yeah. So uh, if there is a starving child in Africa and I do not send them any food, like I have just, I've not participated in saving this child's life and the child dies. That is a tragedy and you know, that, that but happened. you didn't cause it. Right. I didn't cause it. There would be a different moral action if I sent poisoned food to this child in Africa God. and the child died because of my action. In this, both in, in these situations, the child is dead, but I had a different participation in this. And so I'll hear the analogy a lot where um, if either in the life of the mother situation or we're about to talk about in cases of the child, if the child has a disability, um, that people will say, well, it's like an abortion is like if I took my child off of life sustaining treatment. That is not true. Like no. they're saying that because the child is in my womb and taking um, like I am the child's life support. And then by taking the child out of my womb, you know, I have basically removed my child. It's not a good analogy. Um, I have removed the child from life support. That's not what abortion does. Abortion is actively causing the death. That right. is more of the analogy with the child in Africa, of sending the child poison food to cause their death rather than, you know, the circumstances are tragic and that has caused the death of the child, but I didn't actively cause that. Yeah, that that brings me to remember some pro-choicers think that well, then we're all, we're going to be mad at women who have miscarriages. Well, that's that's absurd because miscarriage is against our will and it's also a tragedy. It's mm -hmm. it is a, it is an act of nature perhaps our our bodies or the child's body were sick and there was some cause of miscarriage um, completely against our will. And what we need to do is care for and love on those women and not, I mean, I can't even imagine, I've had multiple friends who've had miscarriages mm -hmm. and 
I mean, when the community surrounds them with love and, you know, sets up a meal train and all of that it, and honors their baby and has a funeral for them. I mean, that's the real pro-life movement. I don't know what the pro-choicers think, uh, why we think that we would be mad at someone who has an, a miscarriage. Yeah. It's absolutely absurd. Okay, what about ectopic pregnancy? Because that's going to be the next thing a yep. pro-choice friend or mm -hmm. friend of me would say. Like, well, okay, what about this one? This one's different. Okay, I have an answer for this too. Abortion drugs don't work on an ectopic pregnancy, sorry, it doesn't work. So you can't say that you have to have legal abortion to help protect women who have an ectopic pregnancy. It doesn't work. You have to have totally t other interventions usually involving surgery. And um, it's not an abortion. What it is, it's a removal of a, of a defective fallopian tube. Mm -hmm. uh, usually an ectopic pregnancy happens in the fallopian tube. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it can happen elsewhere, right. um, but you have to surgically remove it. And, yeah. and um, unfortunately, of course, this will result in the child's death, but you're not directly po poisoning or, or directly knifing up a child like yeah. they do an abortion. That pregnancy doing wasn't gonna make it, it wasn't anyway. viable and it's extremely dangerous so mm -hmm. i want to address some portraits people what they understand is that it's extremely dangerous and you're right you're totally right it's an extremely dangerous situation that this could lead to death of the mother and absolutely death of the child no child's going to make it out of that situation right. um so what they have to do is, is save the mother but a a, a a traditional abortion with like mifepristone misoprostol and um like dnc like those don't work you have to surgically remove the fallopian tube so anyone who actually was speaking at a, a high school youth group at a church a couple weeks ago, and um, these kids come from all different backgrounds, and, and the, where was one young woman in, in the front row who was clearly upset with me for saying that, uh, you know, abortion shouldn't be legal to save life on the mother. And I, I, she, was, she was like ready to stand up and argue with me, and I could tell her. And when I gave her these answers, she completely, her facial expressions, her body language, everything, she was like, I could just tell. She was like, oh my God, I had no idea. I did not know that. Right. She just thought that you have to have legal abortion in order to save these women. Yeah. Any ob -gen will tell you, oh, that's not what we do. I don't know what you're talking about. That's absolutely not what we do. What we do is emergency C-section or emergency removal of a ruptured uterus or fallopian tube or you name it. A pro-abortion physician would tell you the exact same thing. Yeah. 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 Okay, but, I'm done. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> just, well, just, I want to add one more thing real quick. Oh, I know we okay. need to go I, to break. I'm sorry. Take a break. Oh, almost but. done. Uh, Texas does have a very tight definition of abortion in cases of life of the mother. If there really is some uh, out of the blue situation where a woman has to have an abortion in order to save her life, we have a very narrow definition. And you can read about that on our website. It's um, about, you know, the physical life of the mother. The abortion industry will try to put in all of these watered down uh, definitions, but that is, you know. And we need some lawmakers that are biologists. Well, thankfully we have some. Okay. We have quite a few ob in office. <laughs> and they're the ones who are like, guys, get on the same page. Right. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> but we'll come back to this conversation, but we have other important information for you that we will share with you right now. Texas Right to Life is facing 14 lawsuits from Planned Parenthood and the abortion industry. They're suing us because we helped pass the Texas Heartbeat Act. And they're trying to scare us pro-lifers into backing down. Please join us in the fight against Planned Parenthood and donate to protect the Texas Heartbeat Act. You can fight for the unborn and build a pro-life Texas that values every human life. Go to texasrighttolife.com slash lawsuit to make your contribution. Every cent will help and it's greatly appreciated. Social media companies are hiding pro-life content from you. Fight back against big tech. Text PRO-LIFE to 40237 for direct access to the best pro-life news. Since 2019, our web traffic has been down 90% because of big tech censorship. Stay ahead of the censors. When you text PRO-LIFE to 40237, you're in control, not some algorithm telling you what you can and cannot see. Join now, text PRO-LIFE to 40237. Welcome back, friends. So we are dealing with hard cases in arguments, pro-choice arguments in favor of abortion. So we've talked rape and incest, life of the mother. These are both pretty erroneous claims as to why we should kill a child. Um, so what about disability? This one in my head feels even more insane. Yeah. What about cases of disability? Yeah. It, it goes to show uh, how we how we view people who are sick um, through 
from the moment of conception through in our entirety of their lives. Like there's this, this ethic that for some reason be some because someone, um, someone is sick or they live uh, with the presence of a disability, something that's different than you and me, um, that for some reason their life is not as valuable as ours. And mm-hmm. it starts even when you are pregnant. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I have a little soapbox on this one. Um, good friend of mine, young man who I've known for many, many years since, since he was a kid. Um, who's a grown up now and married and it's it's weird, you know, so see little, little I, I'm not gonna say his name, but it's a little boy, well, it does <laughs> make me feel old. Uh, my wife actually taught his sister in, in elementary school. Um, so yeah, we feel old, um, but they're, his, he and his wife, they're first. Um, they knew early on there were some disabilities. There were gonna be some complications. I had an arm that's not fully developed. And yeah, early on, they knew some. there were some issues. They weren't entirely sure the complete um, scope of what it was, but um, as ultrasounds went on and, and stuff. But the doctors kept pushing for abortion. Well, he's gonna have a complicated life. He's gonna have a tough life. Kids are gonna be mean. Um, it's, you know, he's gonna have really complicated condition conditions it's going to be hard for you guys to take care of him it's going to the the slew of reasons why they should just kill their child it's like who asked you doctor shut up right, right? <laughs> um so after um he he's army after very politely telling a bunch of doctors to shove it um they they were committed to uh Liam's life and um ultimately uh his Diaphragm did not develop properly, um, and so the uh, lung cavity, thoracic cavity, and the guts were, anyways, uh, things were not developing properly internally. They made it to about eight months in the Mm. pregnancy, and uh, Liam passed. And my friend said, uh, you know, my son knew the love of his mother's womb straight to the arms of his creator. Oh God, that'll get you. And (laughs) why would I have screwed that up? Yeah. Why would I have murdered my child because life was gonna be difficult for him? We knew there were gonna be challenges. Um, God, I've never been more proud of that boy. Um, So there's no simple answer to a lot of life's questions, but killing a child is the answer to none of them. Yeah, exactly. right. And in that situation, we need healthcare providers to come along and say, hey, this is what reality is, mm-hmm. and this is how we're gonna start preparing for it. Not just, let's go, you know, you need to get out, you need to you need to eliminate the problem. It's, okay, This is, these are challenges, and these, this is what to expect, and here, let's walk together um, mm-hmm. and, and make this, you know, life-affirming, decision um, together. Because I mean, I mean, it just, if we start saying in the womb that, you know, you know, if, if, if there's no, if you're, if you're completely normal, then your life should not be ended through abortion. But if there's something wrong, well, then that's a little different. Right. No, right. what, what is clearly that? clearly discrimination. That is called yeah. ableism. It is. It's called discrimination. And I we mean, complain it about it. We yeah. complain about it when, yeah. when babies, when people are born. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah. Well, and it's funny. I remember in the nineties, well, there, there, there were people like, who said things like that. We, yeah. they, they were they were Nazis. Yeah. Yes. Well, okay. Yeah. Let's go back to the forties. I was going to talk about the nineties. Hey. So let's start with the forties. So the for, in the nineties, or well, in the forties, uh, one of the things that the Nazis did that was so incredibly heinous was they had internment camps, and they would they would bring in people who had either physical or intellectual disabilities, and they would experiment upon them, mm-hmm. and uh, they they would also just completely exterminate. Uh, the ones that they didn't feel like experimenting on. And and Kill. this at the same time in the United States, there was a huge popular movement of eugenics. Margaret Sanger was part of it. And she praised the eugenics movement of Germany and uh, a lot of the Northern European countries. This was a really popular topic, like kind of, I mean, the way people talk about interior decorating, they would talk about eugenics. Like this was a, this was a, it's tea and crumpets conversation. It and was Margaret, a huge deal. Margaret Sanger was one of the founders of the kind of birth control movement in the, in America and one of the founders of what you now know today as Planned Parenthood. Right. Mm-hmm. Yep. So after the U.S. Uh, reporters got involved in 
World War II's Nazi Germany and started leaking essentially everything that was going on and taking photographs and sending it back. And they were finally being published in the newspapers against politicians' will. It became, it, it was like a, it was like a 180. The U.S did a 180 on their views of eugenics. Praise God, they saw what the eugenics philosophy led to and completely changed the culture of the United States to be against eugenics for a very long time. And that was a that was a good thing because they were, of course what they, they saw what the Germans had been doing, the Nazis, I shouldn't say the Germans, mm -hmm. what the Nazis had been doing. Yeah. Now, unfortunately, eugenics is back on the rise again. Mm -hmm. And and it's in the form of, of, of euthanasia uh, of elderly sick people and abortion of young sick people. Mm -hmm. And it's crazy because I remember as a kid in the 90s, there was a huge movement to um, make building facilities and classrooms and all of this more... Um, friendly to people with disabilities. I remember, you know, walking mm -hmm. around churches and they were being remodeled to mm -hmm. include ramps or uh, they were creating these new um, policies and technologies in schools to help yeah. people with blindness or deafness. My brother uh, is deaf, by the way. So, I mean, this was this was all around me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember thinking, what a cool thing to witness. I mean, parks were, were including slides that had lifts. And do y'all remember that? Yeah. I mean, in the 90s, this I was mean, a I mean, really I, big movement. I think that's when the ADA was. Yeah. Yeah, they were American huge. With disabilities and I'm like, Act. that was a great mark in the book mm -hmm. of the United States. What happened after that? What did people forget? We done forgot. Did people forget? Yeah. Like, I remember those parks being built in our neighborhood that were disability friendly. Yeah. If you people can be forgotten. Born. Yeah. yeah. And it's like now, oh, they're gonna have Down syndrome. Or, oh, they're gonna be born without legs. Better kill them before they're yeah. born. I'm like, what were the parks for? Iceland. What were the what were the school policies for? Yeah. yeah. I was going to bring up Iceland, but you Iceland made, brags that they have cured Down syndrome, that they have eliminated Down syndrome. Do you know how they got to that point? They have tested and aborted all children with Down syndrome. And that's just heartbreaking because we talked about this in a previous podcast episode. The one titled, Is Wendy Davis Going to Jail? <laughs> um, not that part, but part two of that episode where people with Down syndrome actually rate their quality of life higher than people who don't. So if I say, oh, maybe my uh, satisfaction with my life is a five or maybe it's an eight, who knows? They consistently rate their satisfaction with their life uh, like around 90%, much higher than uh, other people will. And so it's this idea of, I like how you put it in the last episode, if it's the opposite, well, I'm pro-life myself, it's I'm pro-death for you. Yeah. It's I, th <laughs> yeah. I think you'll yeah. have a poor quality of life. And so Who I'm going you? to, yes, I'm going to impose my beliefs onto you that your life is not worth living. Yeah, it's really sad. What happened to, you know, the 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 not that this was all good but in the 90s it's like everybody's unique and be true to yourself and like that philosophy is gone yeah <laughs> well it's still alive in some weird places yeah. but it's it's gone in the um caring for others yeah, and yeah. caring for it your is. neighbor and yeah. and that life should be uh easy and we need to eliminate suffering as much as possible First of all, if you're a Christian, you cannot ascribe to that. Right. And that's that's right. incompatible no with way. what our calling yeah. is from when Christ. Christ what? said, embrace your cross. So <laughs> that yep. does not involve eliminating suffering. Yeah. I have like very <laughs> low patience for that coming from um, those kind of, those people who ascribe to as Christians. Um, and then the second part is you do have to recognize, yeah, it can be a hard road. It can be a hard road for the parents, for the caregivers. And we've talked about this before, but there are so many resources out there in organizations from yep. parents who have perinatal um, diagnoses diagnoses um, like Able Speaks, Protect Texas Fragile Kids. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's frightening, but there are people doing it around you and there's never, there. you are never going to find someone who agrees that abortion is the best thing for them to do. It is the, a means of last resort. They don't know what else. They don't know that there's any other options out there and they would much prefer a to not no one really wants to kill their child. Right. Mm -hmm. I remember my mom, uh, my mom's super pro-life. And uh, when 
whenever we would, when I was a kid and we would encounter someone who was quote unquote different, um, she would always tell us like, we need to go out of our way to praise the parents for taking care of their baby who is, mm. has some kind of disability. And so she would, she would walk up to a mom whose child, perhaps you know, maybe they were on the autism spectrum and they were throwing a fit in the grocery store. She'd be like, seems like you're having a good day, but I just want to give you a pat on the back. Like you're doing a great job. And I, oh, I'm going to get all teared oh, up right now. And so gosh. she would go out of her way to do that stuff. And That's then she amazing. would just say, you know, like awesome. you never have to apologize. Like we get it. You know, you're, yeah. you're dealing with something more challenging than the average person. Oh, I'm getting all teary eyed. Oh my gosh. Um, and, and good job. You can do this. We got your back. You know, and so just doing those little affirming things for someone in your community can make a parent's day and know that they don't have to apologize for having a kid who's a little different. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Or even a lot different. Like, it's okay. And I really like how Able Speaks put it. Um, so we talked about Able Speaks before on the podcast. They help uh, parents who, whenever the child's not going to live long after birth, or even if they make it to birth, um, that they're going to pass away very quickly. And uh, Abel speaks, uh, the mom says that instead of giving our son an abortion, we decided to give him a name. Yep. And in embracing his life brought them so much more healing than, again, like we talked about earlier of abortion, just covering it up. Like if you, you can just move on if you have an abortion. And that's not how these situations actually play out. Whenever you are allowed the opportunity to heal and to embrace your child's life, even if they're not going to live very long, even if maybe they're born and they are gonna live till they're five years old or something. Uh, and those are really tragic situations, but embracing that life will bring you so much more healing than having an abortion. And it's this concept that great joy and great suffering can exist at the same time. And oftentimes those are some of our most humanizing experiences. Like I think we've all been in that kind of encounter where uh, maybe our loved one is passing away and we get to have those heart to heart moments at the end or uh, in these other situations where we can, um, you know, value this person's life and thank God that, uh, thank God for them in our lives and, um, also, you know, we are suffering for that loss of life. Those can exist at the same time. And oftentimes those are the most um, just humanizing experiences for us. And think about it. If you're, I mean, if you're going through this, um, if you have a diagno perinatal diagnosis, think, would you celebrate your baby's birthday? Or would you celebrate their abortion day? You'd, mm. cel you'd celebrate the birthday. Give yeah. them a birthday. Yeah. 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 Yeah, in, in a lot of ways, the idea of just will cover up the problem. You're, you're creating a psychological cancer mm -hmm. that one day is going to catch up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, that's it's the grief on top that of people killing carry a child. Is yes. So yeah. intense. Yeah. One day that catches up. Yeah. And yeah, it'll, you, you're going to have to deal okay. with that trauma one day. Already, though, I can imagine the pro choice person says, well, what about the baby? You're just prolonging their suffering. It's like it's not shouldn't be just that your personal healing or inability to carry the burden of grief for abortion. Like you need to do this for the baby's sake. Abortion doesn't make the child suffer less. The child in an abortion, the child is ripped limb from limb. Nice. It doesn't solve that problem with all of these hard cases. Abortion solves None of them. It compounds the issue of rape, sex trafficking, incest. It compounds the issues, maybe the physical health issues uh, and psychological issues of a mother who is uh, in a difficult pregnancy and might, you know, the pregnancy is endangering her life. And it compounds the issues of if the child has a disability. This abortion doesn't solve any of them, neither for the child nor the parents. That death is the kind that would be considered the most heinous of war crimes or the most extreme of human rights violations in any other context. Mm -hmm. Right. But yet, it's just, it's in because it's, it's a, in a womb, it's clump hidden. of cells, mm -hmm. it's okay. Um, and as you like yeah. to say, we're all clumps of cells. We right, we are. We are. When do you stop being a clump of cells? Never. <laughs> I mean, the, the tree growing in my backyard technically is a clump of cells, right. so. We're all it's the it's the worst definition of a human ever. Right, right. <laughs> wow. Or any organism. Um, really, yes. We'll need to talk more uh, some other episode, hopefully next week, on um, the science of when life begins and personhood and how to have those conversations. But um, this episode was focused on the hard cases because I know everybody's getting those right now. And it is hard to talk about these very difficult experiences um, of 
like that we see in society, but we have to talk about them. If we shy away from them, uh, we're not doing any service to the parents in that situation, nor to the children. Don't be afraid because you are not, the person talking to you is gonna try to pull at your heartstrings and, um, and you're gonna have to have uncomfortable answers, uncomfortable questions because what they're advocating for is wrong. There is not an answer that is going to be both right and make them feel good. You've got to challenge their assumptions, uh, the premises, and you know, take, be very. Uh, this this is just the truth, and there's yeah. there are facts, and those facts may not be real, all fuzzy warm, but they're there. Yeah, yeah. it's true. You don't have to apologize for teaching somebody truth. It's just, mm -hmm. no. it's just true. You yeah. just gotta be courageous enough to do it. They're inconvenient, but they're true. <laughs> It'd be like so. that. But I'm ching. Okay, guys. Well, I think this, this is really all the time we have for today. We will definitely need to revisit some of these other when life begins issues and these other uh, pro-life apologetics concepts, but we will do that on another episode. So you're gonna have to like and subscribe so you can know when we drop those episodes. Uh, until then, guys, thank you for joining us. Thank you for sharing our table and sharing some coffee. And we will see you next week. Bye.